online um, to our uh, policy session at the 76th Economic Policy Panel meeting. If, if you are seeing this online, you will be delighted to see that we're not all in little boxes today because we are the, the German Ministry of Finance. And I hope the image that you can see really gets over the scale of the German Ministry of Finance, which is quite enormous. Um, <clears throat> we are going to be talking for 90 minutes today. Um, and uh, so our finish is at uh, six o'clock Europe. And that means basically 90 minutes after whatever time that you have, if you're watching this online. We're going to be talking about what can keep Euro inf area inflation high. Not that we particularly want to, but what could. Uh, it's a hybrid panel, as, uh, as you can see. Uh, in a minute, then I will be handing over to uh, Ricardo Reis, who will be presenting his paper on the topic. Uh, we have a big panel responding to it today. So uh, first of all, from the University of Oxford, we will be speaking to Federica Rome. Uh, she will be talking for 10 minutes in response to the paper. Also for 10 minutes, then we will go to uh, Olivier Blanchard. Uh, then for a more policy-focused response, perhaps, to uh, Anya Benasse Kehe at uh, the French Treasury, well, for now, at the French Treasury, and finally back in the room for Wolf Heinrich Reuter, uh, who will, who, uh, well, we're basically in your office, aren't we? Uh, so if we do all of those promptly, we will have enough time for questions. So hint, hint, panel, let's do all this promptly. The best way we can be prompt is uh, for me to stop talking and to introduce Ricardo. So Ricardo, if you'd like to start your presentation. Great. Okay, well, thank you very much for having me and for an invitation to write this policy report. I have to confess that both this paper as well as this presentation um, give reason to why economists are so disliked by members of the general public. Because Moritz asked me to come and discuss what may happen to inflation and its interaction with monetary policy. And as I thought about it, I thought, well, what I think I'm going to talk about is what could go wrong. And this is why economists are always disliked in policy debates for thinking what could go wrong. And what I'll be talking about for the next 30 minutes is precisely that. What could go wrong? Note, I am not saying it will go wrong. I hope it will not go wrong. But I find that my economics education has brainwashed me into always thinking of what could go wrong and trying to prevent it from going wrong, hopefully. Part of the, this, uh, perhaps beyond my education, part of this um, negative outlook comes certainly from looking at the context in which I am coming here on stage. And the context is one in which we have had a dramatic increase in inflation in the Euro area. Um, since the birth of the Euro, it is really a quite remarkable event. It's fashionable sometimes in financial markets to talk about Sigma events. This is an eight Sigma event in terms of how large this increase in inflation has been relative to the standard deviation of inflation over the last 20 years. And moreover, that dramatic increase in inflation came at the same time as an employment rate is at historically low levels, the lowest level ever recorded in the Euro area. So inflation has risen, even though we have not seen any increase in unemployment. Employment is very low. And at the same time, monetary policy, which has been historically loose. To see how loose it has been, a common used measure of the stance of monetary policy is to look not just at the policy rate, but rather at a one or a two year rate and subtract from it a measure of expected inflation one and two years ahead to see what kind of real interest rate is affecting decisions now and is anticipating not just the current monetary policy as well as for guidance of that monetary policy. And while it is clear that monetary policy has been tightening already for quite a few months and even before policy rates increased, as evidenced by the increase in one-year interest rates of AAA um, government bonds in the euro area, note that during that same period, 
expected inflation, I have here the one, results of the Bundesbank survey, but the ECB survey is very similar, has increased much, much more. The scales here are in the same units. In other words, during the last nine months, we have had a loosening of monetary policy of more than 3% in terms of the one-year real rate. This while unemployment is falling and inflation is exploding in some way. So this is a context in which one does have to start asking, wait, could things go wrong or worse? Because we, have, are, in, we are experiencing a very large, many sigma shock to inflation, and at the same time, a very, very loose monetary policy. So this is what I will do. Namely, I will try to answer the, ask the question, what could prevent the ECB from reaching its 2% inflation target two years from now. Certainly bringing inflation down from such a large level to a lower level over the next 12 months is mission impossible in some ways. You know, there's some persistence in inflation processes. But at the same time, we also have good reasons to expect that if a central bank wants a lower inflation, it can deliver that inflation over a medium horizon of two to three years. That's my choice of date. Can it do so? I think it can. And certainly monetary theory supports that idea. And especially the institutional framework of the master's treaty is based on the idea that it can do so. And how to do so is, I would venture, relatively straightforward. It's sure, it's easy. Hike policy rates quickly, persistently, until inflation starts coming down and expectations are solidly re-anchored. Should it do so? Slightly tougher question especially if it looks over the next six months, I could bring inflation down by destroying a lot of things along the way. But again, once one starts look, thinking of 2025, the master's treaty is pretty clear. Deliver price stability in the medium term. You should deliver 2% two and a half years from now. Um, question then is, will it do so? And what I will ask over the next 25 minutes is whether maybe not, and if not, economists have devised a word has become common, which is say that if not, it is because the central bank has become dominated. That is often expressed in the context of fiscal policy dominating central banks. I'm going to extend that and use the word dominance to talk about different types of dominance. That is different types of reasons why the central bank will not do the sure, easy hike that is needed, stop from doing it, and as a result, will end up with high inflation. So to be more precise, starting from high inflation, when would an interest rate setting central bank fail to raise policy rates, choose not to raise them because it is dominated by other factors or agents with an application to the ECB overnight. That's what I'm going to spend the next 25 minutes. Number one, let me start with the first form of dominance, which I'm going to call misjudgment dominance. To do so, let me combine two equations that we already saw in, with Refet an hour ago, two very simple equations, just to back out some el an elementary fact about monetary policy. Nominal interest rates I are equal to real interest rates plus expected inflation. And the central bank chooses nominal interest rates to track where the real interest rate is plus its inflation target and responds to that, uh, deviates from that, and therefore from expected and actual inflation being on target whenever inflation deviates from target according to coefficient phi. It is elementary high school algebra to combine these two equations to end up with how inflation can deviate from target. And misjudgment dominance is about this first term. If the central bank underestimates the neutral rate, where the interest rate would be, where we'd want to set the interest rate, why neutral rate? Because that's where you would have it if inflation was on target. Then it will set too low interest rates for too long and will have high inflation. Very much the topic of the last presentation. When this misjudgment dominance then happens, let me define misjudgment dominance happens when the central bank clings to either an outdated theory or a bad measurement of the economy, perpetually finding excuses for why inflation is rising without pointing to the most obvious reason, which is that you're setting interest rates too low because you think that you should be setting too low. Your R hat is too low relative to R. Of course, the classic example of misjudgment dominance in textbooks is the 1970s. And when it looks at the components of that misjudgment, it is the fact that we had very bad real-time data that pointed to the economy, uh, again, um, at the time we framed this in discussion of natural rates of unemployment potential output. The modern way of doing this is to talk in terms of neutral interest rates, but it's really very similar. 
all the same concept. And we had energy shocks and the belief that everything would be transitory. And all these combined, thinking that all there was was a transitory shock, that it was just an energy shock, the real-time data problems of having these accelerations all led to setting interest rates always too low. Would this happen at the ECB today? Highly unlikely, insofar as um, we have learned the lesson in the 1970s. And yet, simple calculation. Inflation target is 2%. The long run version of R, sometimes called R star, is probably around 1%. 2 plus 1 is 3. That means that you need to raise interest rates at least above 3%. And yet, if anything, we have seen quite a bit of timidity from ECB officials in saying that interest rates will be as high as 3%. Instead, the discussion and even market pricing of what the ECB seems to indicate is to levels below it, indicating very much the kind of misjudgment error. Second, and related, there is not just a measurement, but a conceptual difficulty and a conceptual form of misjudgment dominance. And that is to rely that R star, again, the long run version of R, this neutral rate, will be low for a very long time. This belief fueled the 2020-21 mission review at ECB, because if you believe that R star is going to be low, then you think that uh, ultimately, well, you're always aiming for an R that's not that high, and therefore you're always also underestimating what R hat is, and you therefore end up setting interest rates that are too low. And yet, if one looks at the last 20 years of data, the fall in R star is indeed very striking, the black line in my picture, when using government bond returns. If you look at the returns, the R stars on private capital or any kind of private financial instrument you end up with either constant estimates or estimates that have only slightly declined. In other words, the real striking fact, together with the unambiguous fall in our star from government bonds, has been an increase in the specialness of government bonds insofar as they have started paying a return that's much below the returns that you observe elsewhere in the economy. That has meant that the task of estimating the right R in that equation, and therefore the right R hat to track, is a particularly difficult one, and one that depends on the specialness of public bonds, a specialness that with the increase in public debt post-COVID, with the increase in public debt as a response to the energy crisis, is one that is certainly, and given the events in the UK just five weeks ago, is one that uh, is hard to completely rely on, that makes estimating where R is difficult, and therefore a conceptual reliance on R star will surely be very low is one that endangers precisely doing the misjudgment dominance that I was talking about. Second form of dominance, I call it, for lack of a better name, incredibility dominance. Going back to that equation, another way in which inflation is above target is if expected inflation is above target itself. But here, expected inflation, expected inflation surely depends on actual inflation. People may not have rational expectations, but there will surely be a feedback from what actual inflation is to expect inflation. And given that I'm taking this horizon of two years as my period, I don't have to, I think, be too specific about what exactly is the process of expectation formation and how they translate into actions. I've contributed very much. I spent much of my life on those theories, but the difference between different theories is when you're writing them at the monthly or quarterly level. When your unit is the two years, the medium term, two to three years, I think I can summarize them quite effectively with a very, very simple model. Average expected inflation is a mix of three groups, three attitudes, three types of people, three types of models. One, there's some inattentive people, lambda i is their fraction, who simply think that inflation, expect inflation to be 2%. Because if you ask them, what's inflation going to be in three years, they're going to say Maastricht and the ECB have said 2%. I trust them. I'm inattentive. I don't need to pay attention to anything. Other people, let's call them lambda B, B for backward looking, say, I don't trust anyone. If I expect inflation in three years, in 2025, to be whatever it is right now, whatever I've observed in the last 12 months. And the residual are the people that say, well, expected inflation, I expect it to be what it turns out to be, capturing, again, the very important fixed point in what expectations are. Combine that equation with the previous one and focus on the, not the R hat term, oh. And when can inflation exceed its target? It can exceed its target if we have precisely these backward-looking agents appearing, 
in a situation in which, as we observe now, inflation is above target. The legacy of the last 12 months of inflation is that some backward-looking people are, have appeared. Maybe there were very few, but now there will be many who are thinking, in, I think inflation in two or three years is whatever it was in the last 12 months. What is the solution to this in terms of monetary policy? Twofold. Act tough, which means here have a high phi. Phi was the coefficient of the Taylor rule, was how much you respond to the pi zero being of a pi bar by raising interest rates aggressively and bringing inflation down. And second, talk tough. And talking tough here means simply regaining trust, telling people nothing to see here. Don't worry. I will deliver 2%. You can go back to being inattentive, focusing on your business, focusing on your life, and not having to doubt what inflation is going to be in 25%. That will raise lambda I and again, bring inflation close to target. When this incredibility dominance happens, when you either don't act tough or talk tough, or at least not tough enough. It happens when central banks fail to acknowledge their lack of credibility and hesitate to reassert it. What are the two versions of it, of this general theoretical framework, they will apply to the ECB today. Well, the first one in terms of the acting tough is the clear one. It is raising interest rates high, especially as we're heading into a recession in Europe, is going to be unpopular. The focus on inflation over unemployment is one that may lead you to not act, or not act, sorry, not talk so tough as you may want. But on the acting tough, it is important to remember um, a lesson from monetary policy that is in many ways the most fundamental lesson of monetary policy in the last 40 years. And already at this conference, we've talked about it in the previous paper. And let me try to transmit that fundamental lesson without even using words like the Taylor principle. The fundamental lesson, which is well overshot, over, well displayed in the 1960s and in the 1970s, is that when you have inflation rising and you know you need to raise rates, you think that you need to raise rates to a certain level, you do not want to converge to that from below. That is not enough. Because of the expectations, lack of credibility, that target is always going to keep on drifting up and up and up, and you'll always be trying to approach from below. It sounds counterintuitive for most actions or policies, but you want to overshoot. Overshoot is not getting it wrong. It is the only way of doing it. You want to approach your la your where you want to end up from above. You want to cross it and hit it from above. The Taylor rule, phi bigger than one, is one mathematical representation, a very elegant one that John Taylor probably deserves a Nobel Prize for, of tra transmitting this extremely important principle of monetary policy. Gradualism is wrong. Overshooting is right when it comes to bringing down inflation. That is the lesson of the 70s and 80s. And note, by the way, how once you are above, you can come down really quickly. Paul Volcker cut rates very, very quickly, by the way. It wasn't just about raising them quickly. It's about once you're above, cutting very quickly. And that is the, where the fears that, as we hear so much about gradualism, um, one worries about that dominance setting. So I testified at the European Parliament just five weeks ago, and gradualism was alive and well. You should never overshoot. That's a big mistake. No, this is the most fundamental principle of monetary policy. You want to overshoot. Number three, the more famous one, of course, is fiscal dominance. Now, in its simplest version, fiscal dominance is when the government calls you and says, print money to pay for the army bills. And as you print money, that money is worth less and inflation comes. It's not worth spending more on this than a sentence that is clearly ruled out by Maastricht that is not going to happen. There's no way in which the central bank is going to print money to pay the bills of the German Ministry of Finance. But that doesn't mean that that's the end of fiscal dominance. And so let's talk about fiscal dominance as it applies in modern times and potentially to a country like this, to a region like the ECB. To think about fiscal dominance, you always have to go to the government budget constraint. If B is the amount of debt you've promised to pay and delta is how much of it you actually pay, either 100% or less, delta times B is the resources you use to repay the debt. You can repay it through primary balances, F, the primary balance, or you can repay it by being able to sell bonds at a price Q that is very low relative to the interest rate that the required returns by investors in the economy. The term I've called this the debt revenue term. You're just able to get revenue by selling very cheap debt. Final, 
Finally, the last term is, of course, the market's expectation. Well, it is really the debt that you leave to the next period discounted by the market return. Why? And why am I going to take this, three ter this third term as fixed? Because once you look at the future debt discounted by the market rate, that's going to depend only on future surpluses, future debt revenues. And therefore, from my medium run perspective, I can take that as fixed. Note that if I had just killed these one plus R terms and written this as QB prime, I couldn't do that because the Q will depend on the future deltas. That depends on the current, uh, current interest rates. It's by writing the budget constraint in this way that I can neglect the third term and focus on the previous two. Now, what is the form of dominance? When you raise interest rates, I, the policy rate, that's going to trigger a variety of mechanisms of fall in bond prices, an increase in 10-year yields. That increase in I by lowering Q lowers that revenues. And that means the fiscal authority is going to have to match the tightening to bring down inflation with either austerity, lowering F, or default, delta less than one. That is the pressure, the fiscal dominance. Don't raise interest rates because that's going to lower my Q. It's going to lower my debt revenue. At the same time, though, central banks not just set interest rates, but also engage in quantitative easing balance sheet type policies. That is, they choose the amount of reserves, V, relative to the amount of government bonds, B, that are out there. What is the role of increasing V, reserves, is that when you go and buy government bonds, you make those government bonds more scarce in terms of the uh, amount that's out there for the private sector to hold. As they become more scarce, their specialness in terms of their value as collateral, liquidity, store of value, and safety gets preserved, gets protected, that pushes up their price and pushes up the debt revenue. So fiscal dominance happens when the central bank does not raise interest as it should because it will have an impact on especially this debt revenue term that will trigger fiscal actions that may not be there. In other words, raising policy rates is fear to break the government's budget. What are the three ways in which this can happen? First is you don't want to do it because... Uh, you're tempted by realizing that if I let inflation go up, that in itself by preventing a recession can increase the fiscal balances or can lower the B, the value of the debt. That is a form of fiscal dominance that should be the one to be avoided because it partly it's due to a misconception. Inflating away the debt, letting inflation run will relax your budget constraint for the first few months or even it has over the last 12 months. But by making the debt less safe, in terms of now inflation risk, less useless collateral because of the volatile inflation that comes with it, and a less appealing store of value for foreigners because with inflation comes, as Rafet just showed us, a depreciation of the exchange rate, you are making the debt revenue term shrink into the future. And therefore, this high inflation comes instead with higher financial and fiscal conditions. Second, as I said, the central bank can raise interest rates and at the same time be able to keep debt revenues high as long as it buys government bonds. Indeed, arguably, some of that has been going on. However, to be note that the debt revenue for the fiscal authority, its ability to sell these very high-priced bonds is emerging here because there's some guy on the other side who's paying a lot for these bonds. And who's paying a lot for the bonds right now? It's the central bank relative to what market returns are. In other words, by doing the central bank is inexorably finding itself in a situation in which it will be starting to make losses will need to be recapitalized. And therefore, the benefits, the debt revenue benefits, are partly offset by the losses that that central bank accrues. There is a clear limit in doing so. In forgetting about this limit can lead one to overly optimistic uh, interventions in terms of balance sheet policy of the central bank. Finally, third, and one that's very central bank specific, is that this budget constraint, of course, applies to the euro area as a whole, but there's one of these for each country, and you can increase the B in one while lowering the B in others, or sorry, you can increase the, the purchases of, of some bonds uh, of some regions as opposed to others. In doing so, the ECB is rightfully preventing rollover crisis. Why? Because the reserves of central bank are in perpetuity. You don't, the ECB does not need to roll over its reserves, it's borrowing. Whereas government bonds have to be paid and rolled over. So this we engages in balance sheet policy, it is preventing rollover crisis or some diminishing them. However, there is a very thin line between preventing rollover crisis in some, in some regions rather than others, and this leading to transfers 
and preventing solvency problems across regions. Insofar as that happens, it is, of course, the legality of the euro that comes under question. And remember that, after all, inflation is nothing but the real value of a euro. And so any, even if remote doubts on the legality of the euro, translate immediately into high expected inflation and thus high actual inflation, therefore leading to the dominance of uh, over the desire to lower inflation. Fourth form of dominance, financial dominance. The interest rates on credit in the economy deviate from the interest rates set by the central bank over the space of those two years, say, in terms of loan. First of all, well, they're anchored by the interest rate of the central bank because the, the bank could always deposit the central bank. But they do mean <laughs> partly because there is a markup, an intermediation margin in offering credit, and partly because macroprudential policy, which in its many guises consists ultimately of telling banks that you can't lend as much to the risky private sector, but you have to put some of it in safe assets. And what's the safe asset? Government bonds. An increase in the desire uh, in the requirement that banks hold government bonds leads to an increase in that margin because it implies that uh, resources, assets are driven there as opposed to credit to the economy. On the other hand, banks also take deposits, which are themselves anchored by the interest rate that uh, of deposits of the bank at the central bank, but deviate from it because banks have monopoly power, market power over the depositors, mu D. And moreover, the amount of liquidity captured by those reserves V means that the more liquidity there is, the closer will deposit rates be to the, to the central bank. Because you'll essentially, by having more liquidity, you will uh, reduce the market power that banks have in supplying deposits, which are the form of payment for many consumers. Now, in this context, it means, and you can subtract one from the other to end up with the intermediation margin and how it depends on um, both macroprudential policy, balance sheet policy, as well as interest rates, because interest rates affect these markups. Higher rates hurt higher interest rates right away, increase uh, the interest rates on credit, they hurt borrowers, and they also, because higher rates come with more monopoly power of banks, this has been well established, they also hurt depositors. At the same time, note that looser macroprudential policy, lower beta, could lower intermediation costs, and more abundant reserves will lower the scarcity of deposits. Financial dominance happens when a central bank in setting interest rates is taking into account the effect that its higher interest rates has on credit and deposit rates, fears those consequences, is not willing to use macroprudential or balance sheet policy to offset those consequences, and therefore, for fear of causing a financial crisis, resists bringing inflation down. How could that happen at the ECB today? The news. Groups in the housing sector and the banking sector arguing that interest rates cannot rise all that fast, all that quickly, because this will affect intermediation margins and will lead to redistribution between different agents in the financial market. Note, by the way, that this interacts very strongly with the misjudgment dominance. It is precisely as rates are increasing, have to increase quickly, and this leads to shifts in the intermediation margin between different forms of credit, it becomes hard to measure what the R hat is because you have all these interest rates moving in different directions. But first and importantly, financial dominance is the dominance of financial sector lobbying not to have rates raised so quickly as that would hurt intermediation margins. A second form of dominance is when you're unwilling to use macroprudential and liquidity policies, size of the balance sheet, to handle the financial stress. If raising interest rates puts stress in financial markets, then it will be by using these other policies that we prevent financial dominance and monetary policy. The reason why macroprudential policy was so staunchly defended by central banks in the last 12 years was precisely so that you could use interest rate policy as needed and then use macroprudential policy to respond to the financial stress. To now come to the situation where you're unwilling to raise interest rates to control inflation because of the financial stress is an admission of defeat of macroprudential policy and is a defeat that is a self-inflicted harm, use the macroprudential policy to do so. Of course, though, you may not want to do that because, again, the macroprudential policy right now would be a loosening of macroprudential policy in order to offset the effects of the tightening monetary policy. But, of course, that would have implications on the debt revenue term and feed into dominance. The third one, though, is perhaps the third form of dominance is the one that I hope 
will be the one that certainly doesn't happen, but it's certainly the scarier one. It is a scary one because I remember the Euro crisis of 10 years ago. An important, I think, after 10 years of writing and thinking about the, Euro, the sovereign debt crisis of 2010-11, I think there's been a somewhat agreement, subject to healthy debates, that a big part of it was the so-called diabolic loop. That when banks hold a lot of bonds and the bond prices go down, those banks suffer losses. Those losses mean that the um, bank um, um, is more likely to default and be bailed out, or that it lends less and contracts the economy, both of which justify an increase in sovereign debt risk, which puts that, pushes down the bond price. It has also been relatively diagnosed, although certainly more controversial, how to fix the diabolic loop. But all solutions end up rotating around this triangle I wrote here. You need some form of deposit insurance at the EU level so that a bank is not so tightly tied to its own sovereign. With deposit insurance has to come that the banks can't take as much concentrated sovereign risk. So you need some form of risk weighing and not letting banks just hold the bonds of their sovereign and treat them as if they were 100% safe. And then once you do that, you need to give the banks then some euro-wide safe asset that can be held. And these three reinforce each other and go around. We've certainly spent the last seven years discussing how to reach this triangle. You can reach this triangle with a very um, a, a safe asset with minimal fiscal units, such as an SB, a very limited amount of deposit insurance, just some loose concentration limits. You can reach this with a very radical form of fiscal union, banking union, where we have complete EUI deposit insurance, a euro bond, and um, sovereign bonds not being really special. In between, though, we've been discussing, discussing, and We've done very little. If it turns out now that the increase in interest rates by the ECB to control inflation leads to the fallen bond prices that triggers a diabolic loop and that we have repeated 2011 and 12, it would be truly a dramatic punishment for our lack of reforms the last few years, of a problem that's very well diagnosed and whose solution is clear. And the question is just politically, how wide or tight do you want this triangle to be? Finally, recession dominance. Uh, recession dominance. Inflation, last equation, inflation depends on expected inflation, output gap, and on supply shocks, where output gaps are negatively related to interest rates. Why so far I was treating that R as something that existed? This is how you close the model. You bring the macro general equilibrium and you bring the R back into what determines it. Okay. By the way, nothing of what I said right so far changes once you include it. Importantly, though, this brings inflation as being driven also by fears of a recession because of the epsilon shocks. And by the way, all the other policies can also affect potentially what that epsilon is. Who are those shocks? Energy markers, deglobalization, sectoral adjustments. When you have a positive markup, as these epsilons are often called, bringing down inflation quickly will come with a negative output gap. Recession dominance will happen when the central bank does not want to cause a recession. And so lets inflation get out of hand, if you want. Instead of not wanting to break the government budget or the financial sector, you don't want to break the economy. I end with this. This is the last form of dominance because to be clear that it's not so bad to be dominated sometimes. Worrying about not breaking the EU economy is something that I hope the ECB is doing. And so being partly recession dominated is a good idea. We shouldn't be trying to bring inflation so aggressively and so quickly down that we cause a massive recession. Still, in thinking about whether we'll still have high inflation two years from now, we're going to ask whether we are too dominated by the recession in a way that makes inflation persistent, which is what the final three points are. The first one is the easier one, which is if you delay bringing inflation down, you're going to get more of those lambda B expectations. You're going to require an even larger recession down the end. Again, classic 1970s lesson of monetary policy. More interesting is that as inflation persists, as you say, let me just delay the recession. Let me delay the increase in interest rates so that the recession is not quite as bad in the next six months. What you end up with is with a classic result in, again, the study of monetary policy. Tom Sargent is often associated with it through his book, Conquest of American Inflation, but it's a more general point, which is that as you let inflation persist, the slope of this Phillips curve, this kappa, starts getting higher and higher and higher. And at some point, your Phillips curve is very vertical and actually raising interest rates is doing very little to cause a recession. All it will be doing is lowering inflation. But more specific to ECB today, beyond these very two classic questions, is the extent to which, as these Epsom shocks emerge, can you 
is whether you start interpreting every shock as a shock that affects epsilon. And so when you start looking at whether it's the increase in transport costs, the increase in gas prices, or even the stockouts that one observes today, that they're all just recession-inducing events that can be offset by monetary policy, as opposed to simply a lower potential output in the economy. Realizing that with these shocks, we are going to be poorer, and there's nothing the central bank can do about it. The central bank should focus on inflation. Conclude, and sorry, I went a few minutes over. Um, I wanted to end with the, with the recession dominance. To emphasize that, economic policy always requires a balancing act. Central banks should not be inflation nutters, in the words of Mervyn King, that are completely not dominated by fiscal, financial, conceptual, and recession considerations. You shouldn't have zero forms of dominance at all. It is healthy that there's a dominance. However, understand that those dominance emerge. The question is, when thinking about this gloomy precaution perspective of imagining doomsday scenarios in which we become seriously dominated and we don't bring inflation down in the next two years, I thought it helps to come up with a taxonomy that I try to come up through in this in these 30 minutes of here are the different ways of dominance, misjudgment, incredibility, fiscal, financial recession. And in looking at those, be vigilant to see whether they indeed become, these forms of dominance become dominant in terms of the discourse. I end again as an economist, glass half full in that I think there's good arguments that DCB has not succumbed to any of these dominance. Glass half empty, because for all of them, all of us should be paying attention and holding DCB accountable because there's certainly a lot of forces pushing for these dominances to become dominant. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ricardo. That's a pretty full 30 minutes. We're quite prepared to give you your extra two. Uh, Federica, I want to uh, come to you now for your response. Can you see the slide? Yes. Yes. Okay. So first of all, thank you very much for giving the opportunity to read this report and paper. It was very informative. I mean, as I, I think it's an amazing uh, piece. And also to be in such an amazing panel. I'm sorry not to be there, but I'm super pregnant. So <laughs> like it's, it's also very difficult to do everything. So the question is like, what can keep the inflation high, your inflation high? And what Ricardo says that there are four reasons or I mean, more than four reasons, but in this case it's like, first one is misjudgment. So maybe we misjudge what is the uh, real interest rate. And so we don't target uh, the right inflation and we didn't, didn't increase the interest rate enough. The second is the incredibility. So the idea is that we don't believe of what the central bank would do. And then there are some agents maybe with adaptive expectation. And despite the central bank is doing its best, then we don't believe to, the, to her. The third reason is the fiscal policy. So in this case, we think like that by messing up with the interest rate, we will have some effect on the fiscal policy. And maybe the central bank is reluctant to do something like that. I'm simplifying a lot, right? But the fourth one is this financial, financial market dominance. So the idea that, again, the central bank doesn't want to mess up with the financial market too much. So it's not, she's not increasing the interest rate. And the fifth one is that, OK, to solve this sort of problem where we have very high energy price, an easy way to do it, I mean, this is like a sort of technological shock. So we can think that divine coincidence solves like, but what happened is also that maybe there is some reason why markups also are going to change. And then in this case, we're going to have a markup shock and we don't want to create some recession. Now, Ricardo said during the presentation, what could go wrong? So we are economists. So since he, he was like presenting five reasons why things can go wrong, I will add some more pessimism and <laughs> we'll add the two other reasons why I think something could go wrong despite the central bank is trying to do their best. The first one is what I'm go going to call a reverse currency war. And the second is something that I think like not many people are paying attention to. And is the fact that there is a lot of heterogeneity at the moment of the monetary union, despite most of the country are exposed to the same shock. So I will go to the first one that is this reverse currency war. Now, as Ricardo was point out, pointing out in the presentation, we are in a moment in which we have very high inflation and low unemployment. That is true 
both in the US, in Euro, and in part also in, in the UK. And we can agree that we can present this situation in a simplified way, thinking that there are scarcity of goods. So demand is not low enough. I mean, demand is quite high. However, we, we're not producing enough. Now, country can decide either to produce a good, and this will generate some inflation, or they can decide to buy their goods from the rest of the, the world. There could be a simple strategy. How? Well, there is an easy way, if you think from an international uh, economist point of view, that is you can appreciate your domestic currency. And this is still in line with having a tightening of the monetary policy. So what you can do is like, you tighten your monetary policy, you appreciate your currency. So from one side, you have a positive effect because you keep inflation low. And on the other side also, you're buying more international goods at a cheaper rate. So in some sense, uh, this will generate a sort of negative spillover because here we have a global shock. Each country, they want to tighten their own monetary policy. But on the other side, this is going to have some negative effect on the trading partners, right? So if the US dollars is very strong, then what is going to happen is also that it will be much more difficult for the European Union to keep the inflation at the target. Why? Because we are in part, we are like in habit, we get inflation from buying US goods at a higher rate or being like, so now it's more expensive, let's say, to buy whatever is set in US dollar. And we know from the work of Gita Gopinath and coders that most of the trade is invoiced in US dollars and also most of the energy price is invoiced in US dollars. So one reason why even if the ECB will do her best, she will struggle to achieve an inflation at the target is the fact that if our trading partners are to have this very strong currency, this will import some inflation in our country or in the ECB country. I'm living in the UK, so maybe you shouldn't say our country, but still is like I feel part of the monetary union. So uh, just to give you an idea what is going to happen, there is this nice report of the IMF made by uh, Per Oliver Gurinchas and Gita Gopina that show that what happened now is that the US dollar uh, is appreciating quite a lot. And this makes very difficult for many countries to fight inflation. They mostly focus on advanced, sorry, an emerging economy, but still also for advanced economy, this is going to be a problem. And here you can see, for example, what happened to the term of trades recently, that there was a big worsening of the term of trade in, in Europe, while there was a big improvement in the US. So in some sense, like let's even assume that Within the monetary union, we tackle all the dominance. Still, what could happen is that we, have, we are under a big global shock. All the players that are trying to, to play their best policy. However, this could have some spillover effect across different countries. Now, let me go for the second uh, point uh, that is, now we're observing that uh, we have a global shock that is the same within the monetary union. So in some sense, uh, there was a previous literature that was speaking about optimal currency area where we were thinking, okay, what happened if we have different country with different shock, someone is like in a recession, someone in a boom. This is like the same shock across the country, but there is a big difference. Inflation are reacting in a very different way. You have to, for, for example, to the exposition to the shock. So some country decided to ban gas from Russia much before the other country due to fiscal policy, you do many things, right? And what happened here, yeah, I'm just plotting in the last month, what is the harmonized uh, index of consumer price within the monetary union. And you can see that there is a lot of difference. And especially if you plot the standard deviation of inflation, so HCIP inflation, you can see that for many years, this is monthly inflation, the standard deviation is very stable. And then in the last month, was, there is a huge increase in the standard deviation, meaning that there are some countries that are reacting having an inflation of four or 5%, and countries that are reacting having an inflation at 20%. So I think like with such big heterogeneity, it's very difficult to understand what does it mean to have inflation at two percentage points, because let's assume that the same one monetary policy shock has the same effect across all the countries within the monetary union. And this is not the case. I mean, I don't have time to plot all the impulse response function, but if you plot impulse response function, 
also they're going to have heterogeneous effect. But let's simplify saying, okay, all countries react the same and the price in all countries are going to react the same. What is the shock? What is the interest rate that the central bank should set in order to target to 2%? And what is going to mean for different countries? So does it mean that some countries are going to be at minus seven and other at 11? Or how they're going to restore inflation at the target in many countries? And also the second question that I think is going to add even more to the debate is that once some country are going to arrive to one or two percent, are going to be are this country going to be happy to face higher interest rate in order to keep inflation low in the bordering country of the monetary union, or are they going to complain about that? Or are the countries that are going to have high inflation that are at the top of the distribution willing or bargaining in order to have higher interest rates, and they're maybe they're not going to care about the recession? So to conclude, and I hope that I'm going to be in time. So the question is like, can the ECB keep the inflation at the target? Now, my answer is that even if they tackle all the dominance, there are many factors for, what, for which it's very difficult for the ECB in the next two years to keep the inflation at the target. But I want to be positive, and I think that with a strong cooperation among the European countries, so within the European Union, and those among the global economies, this may be, be possible. Okay, thank you. I hope that I'm on time. You, you were on time. Thank you very much. Uh, that's not how I often think about international cooperation, but the image is a strong one. Thank you, Federica. Uh, Olivier, uh, now uh, for your response. Thank you. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, will will the ECB be able to get inflation down to target in finite time? And I agree with Ricardo as the choice of uh, the end of 2024 as being the outside bound on, on reasonable finite time. And I, I found the paper extremely useful uh, in making a list, going through each argument and showing the interaction. Uh, the, different, uh, uh, the different dimensions. I, I agree, actually, I think that the list should add uh, two items that Federica uh, mentioned. Uh, that I had not focused on them, but I think she's completely right. Um, I think it would be useful, the, the word dominance is a bit misleading, maybe. Uh, I think it would be useful to distinguish between the issues which have to do, which don't have to do with, with dominance in a strict sense, and the ones which do. And in the first ones, it's basically even if there was no dominance of any kind, fiscal or financial, uh, you know, how, how, how does uh, ECB get the inflation rate down to where it wants? And there are just enormous issues there, uh, whether you call it misjudgment or just uncertainty about what needs to be done. But for example, Ricardo rightly emphasized that the short run real rate is extremely negative still, but the long run real rate is, is more reasonable, not quite where I would like to see it, but more reasonable. So which is the rate which really matters? Uh, is it a catastrophe that the short rate is so low? Um, in the case of the ECB, a big issue is the state of demand, not now, but to come in the next year, and the state of supply. And as we know, Europe is facing a, a potential gas uh, shortage, which has enormous issues on what's going to happen to supply and demand. And therefore, it could be that demand falls on its own without the ECB having to do more, or that the supply side issues become bigger and the ECB has to react more. But that by itself is just a gigantic set of issues, which means that maybe the ECB will not succeed in getting uh, a soft landing. And that's quite possible. On the issues related to dominance, which is what I'm going to focus in the remaining uh, eight minutes or so, I'm going to make three points, uh, which I think are connected. Uh, the first one is fiscal dominance is relevant, but maybe not through the standard textbook uh, channel. The second point is that financial dominance is relevant, but again, maybe not through the usual textbook channel. And the third one is that a crucial issue is the elasticity of demand and by implication of inflation to the interest rate. And that very strongly interacts with the relevance of fiscal and financial dominance. I think that interaction is, is very important. So 
on fiscal dominance. Uh, I mean, the, the standard story is that governments want to finance their deficit in an easy way and therefore rely on monetization of deficits. I'm not sure that's the relevant channel uh, uh, at, at this stage for the Eurozone because of all the uh, legal institutional constraints. But the relevant channel is when monetary policy increases the interest rate, it increases debt service. And that puts some countries uh, in, in a very difficult uh, situation. Uh, what makes it particularly difficult in the case of the Eurozone is the relation between the spreads and the safe rate. Uh, there seems to be a relation, nearly a mechanical relation, between the spreads and the safe rate. Now, it's true that an increase in the safe rate increases the probability that, uh, you know, that service, that service is higher in the high deck countries and therefore there's a bit of more risk that things go wrong. But if there's a systematic relation, between the safe rate and the spread, then that creates serious problems of the ECB. I don't think that the TPI is a solution to that. Uh, we can come back to it. The, the, uh, the program that the ECB has put in place to deal with spreads uh, is not relevant when fundamentals are potentially at stake. Um, so for fiscal dominance, I think that's the relevant channel. And clearly, the ECB must be thinking about it. On financial dominance, and the standard story uh, is that you know the debtors are going to hate the higher interest rates and they are going to lobby in order to avoid it. I think it's true, but I think what we learned, for example, from the UK pension fund example, is any sharp change in the interest rate, whether up or down, although down is not likely in the short run, uh, is a potential issue which is that financial institutions take positions not thinking hard enough about the free standard deviation changes in interest rates. And that means that interest rates have to move slowly, which is an issue, as uh, Ricardo has emphasized. Uh, one of the arguments he made is you may have to move strongly to show that you're serious. But if you do this, uh, financial dominance of that kind becomes relevant. Then the, the, the third factor is this elasticity of demand and inflation uh, to, to the interest rate. And here again, there is enormous uncertainty about it. But to the extent that demand remains quite robust, so this is not the case for the ECB at this point, but that's the case for the Fed, uh, you may have to increase interest rates a whole lot in order to basically slow things down. Uh, if the effect of demand on inflation is weak, you have to increase interest rates a lot. There is a twist, which is monetary policy works with a lag, basically a one-year lag before you really see the effects. But the big issue is credibility of a declaration by the ECB that you have to wait. We're doing the right thing, but you have to wait 12 months. Therefore, the lags for central banks to increase interest rates more to show that they are really do, doing something. Now, as Ricardo said, that might be useful, but it could be overdone, and that's an issue. And to the extent that interest rates increase very much, the fiscal dominance issue, which I discussed, and the financial dominance issue, which I discussed, become very relevant. So this interaction seems to me to be central. Let me end with you know, the big question. Okay, so these are all the ifs. Now, what do I think uh, the risk is of derailment? And I, I think for the Fed, which we're not talking about, the risk of derailment, the need to increase interest rates a whole lot is there. Uh, I think this may lead to fiscal dominance. It may lead to financial dominance. If the Fed is not done by the time, not the midterms, but the actual elections come, and Mr. Trump is reelected, I think independence of a central bank is an issue. And therefore, there's a scenario, small probability scenario, that things really go bad. Again, these are very small probabilities in my, in my mind, but they're not zero. And I can think of a scenario along these lines. I think for the ECB, it's quite different. And the fiscal dominance basically is, I think, not an issue, given the fact that there are so many members to the Eurozone, that for them to agree to fiscal dominate the ECB, is nearly impossible. So I think fiscal dominance will not happen, at least not in a very explicit way. Um, in terms of interest rates, again, I think the ECB will not have to increase interest rates as much as the Fed. The reason is I think demand 
and supply are going to have big issues in the short run. And that might lead to an increase in unemployment without the ECB having to do a whole lot. So the combination of probably a much smaller increase in interest rates and uh, no fiscal dominance in the in the sense I described make me think that the ECB will avoid a derailment. Uh, so I'm more optimistic about the ECB. I don't think the risk of uh, derailment uh, is, is very large. Let me stop here. Olivia, thank you very much. And uh, so now we go to uh, Agnes. Uh, Agnes, welcome. What is your response? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tim. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Um, okay. I tried to share my screen. So, sorry. Can you see it? You see it? Yeah. Okay. So thanks for, for the invitation. Obviously, uh, since I'm uh, uh, working uh, presently at the uh, Ministry of Finance, I'm not going to comment on the uh, central banking uh, uh, and, and on the ECB, but perhaps I, I will uh, discuss a little bit uh, the uh, role of the government uh, in taming inflation. So what I want to do is uh, to uh, go through three key messages of the textbook like uh, messages. The first one is that inflation is a tax, so it should be good for the budget balance. The second one is that inflation is monetary phenomenon. And so governments should stay away uh, from, from, from it and um, manage their, their own affairs. Uh, and a third, uh, that monetary and fiscal policy are both demand-side policies, so to a certain extent, uh, substitutable. Uh, first thing is inflation are always good for budget balance. Here, what we have is a trade drop, it has been said. Uh, so if you uh, look at a very standard, so this is the, the, the model we are, we are using, the macro model we are using at, at the Treasury. Uh, if you increase the uh, price of oil uh, in, in that kind of model, you have an increase in the consumer price index. So this is the third line and an increase in the GDP deflator, but uh, CPI increases more than the GDP deflator. And this is exactly what it is about in terms of the truck. Uh, and GDP goes down. So the whole thing is a, a negative impact on the primary balance. Why? Uh, because of the fall of GDP but also because of the spread between the uh, consumer price index and the GDP deflator, because spending is more or less, uh, goes, uh, increases more or less with the CPI, whereas revenues uh, are more mostly indexed on the GDP deflator. So if there is a gap between the two, then uh, there is uh, less uh, revenue compared to uh, the increase in spending. As in a nutshell, uh, there is a tax revenue. Yes, that's right. But the, the revenue is not for us. The revenue is for the rest of the world, for oil exporting countries. So uh, on top of that, as you know, uh, several European countries, and for instance, French, have uh, decided some discretionary spending to address uh, this uh, crisis. So this may be a good thing or a bad thing. I will discuss this later on. It's about two or three percent of uh, GDP, which is quite sizable. Uh, they are. Uh, I, I'm not going to in the details of the of the spending. So if we uh, write down the snowball effect, so BT being uh, the to GDP ratio at the end of of uh, year C. Uh, so here you have the usual, the usual accumulation uh, equation. Uh, with the nominal interest rate minus the inflation rate, but you need to extract the part of, uh, uh, of the debt that is indexed on inflation, in the French case is uh, 12%. And then you have the impact on growth, uh, if growth goes down, uh, so this is not so favorable. And then uh, the second term is the primary balance. And as I said, you have to take into account the cost of trade stocks, the T, which uh, increases spending compared to uh, the revenues um, due to this uh, terms of trade stock. Uh, 
Um, so in the short term, uh, there is a, a positive impact uh, on that, so meaning uh, that it, it, this uh, shock may reduce the debt to GDP ratio, uh, but the impact is uh, uh, mitigated by, uh, it, it, of course, uh, 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 inflation uh, and also uh, impact on growth. And in the longer term, of course, the interest rate goes up. And, and to the extent that the shock is permanent, uh, you still have the terms of trade shock. Second thing, uh, should governments always uh, keep their hands off prices? So uh, Ricardo made a very brilliant pr presentation, and it was, but it was from the point of view of, of the central bank. And I was uh, interested uh, uh, by the different uh, kinds of dominance. Um, uh, there, there was, uh, he talked about uh, expectations, he talked about mis misjudgment, uh, but he didn't talk about indexation. So I think that the, the general story is that governments should not try to control prices. Uh, why? It's very well known. The, the, you should keep the price signal on and prices are difficult to control and it could uh, introduce some inefficiencies and it's very costly. However, um, governments have an impact, do have an impact on wages. And uh, so governments can, in a certain, to a certain extent, mitigate second round effects. Uh, so it could be direct through the minimum wage. It could be through, uh, uh, through civil servants' uh, um, pays. It could be through um, indexation of uh, transfers of uh, pensions. Um, there could be also some locking effects where nominal, if nominal wages can hardly fall, if there are nominal rigidities downward, uh, it could, uh, so it could be a good thing to avoid uh, excessive uh, increase in wages because later on they, could, they will not be able to come down if energy prices uh, go down. And so the, um, the difficulty for governments and the challenge for the governments would be maybe uh, to uh, organize some kind of redistribution uh, within uh, across uh, different workers with low uh, income workers being well uh, protected by some form of indexation, whereas the terms of trade shock would hit the purchasing power of better, uh, better off uh, workers. Now, uh, does it make a, a difference in the long term uh, in terms of uh, inflation and in terms of uh, price levels? So with uh, anchored expectations, and here I, I follow completely, uh, I agree completely with uh, Ricardo, with anchored expectations, uh, the price level will stabilize quickly at a low level uh, if there is just an increase in energy prices. But with bond wagon expectation, uh, with the lambda B, uh, the price level takes more time to stabilize and it will stabilize at high level, uh, especially with full indexation. And here I wanted to show you a few uh, simulations. So here, suppose you have uh, two goods, uh, an energy, so an energy good and non-energy good. Uh, and there is an increase, a one-off increase uh, in the energy price. So you, you may accept uh, this increase or government may want to smooth the increase of uh, the energy goods uh, and uh, through a kind of a price control. So what if, if, uh, if uh, expectations are well anchored, then this will, uh, um, this means that the non-energy uh, prices are, the, the inflation is zero. So the, um, the, the price of the non-energy goods will uh, follow with full indexation the increase in wages and the increase in wages is uh, um, indexed on uh, energy good because the other one uh, is well anchored. So you have a very small increase in uh, inflation. But if you have bond wagon expectations, of course, the story is completely different. And then, uh, uh, the difference between the two uh, curves, the no cap curve and the inflation smoothing curve, uh, is significant in the short term and converge in the longer term at a higher level, of course, is there is full indexation compared to, to uh, only partial indexation. And what I want to, uh, to say here is that with full indexation, you have slower convergence, but to a higher inflation with partial indexation, you have faster convergence, 
to a lower inflation, uh, with a lower inflation. Um, and the challenge today is whether there is a relationship between management of energy prices, so the potential, potentially the smoothing of the increase in the energy prices, uh, the expectations, so whether a bump pattern effect um, starts kicking in, and the indexation. And this relationship is not clear to me. Uh, it's possible that with um, a more stable, infl more smooth inflation increase, you, you give uh, agents more time to adjust, uh, also because there is less uh, instability of uh, relative prices, so it's less costly for the economy, and it's possible that it has an impact on the degree of indexation. Uh, uh, so at the end, you would, you would end up with less inflation. It's not so clear whether, um, in my view, it's not so clear whether governments have nothing to do uh, with uh, inflation. This can go through minimum wages, it can go through indexation policies, but also through uh, the, um, the policy concerning the smoothing of uh, the energy shock. A uh, final uh, thing uh, is a fiscal policy always a demand side policy. Uh, so here I have a table with a few examples. Uh, where um, fiscal policy and monetary policy have been congruent uh, to, to, give, to take uh, the vocabulary of a uh, uh, new paper with uh, uh, some authors. Um, so having congruent or divergence. And in purple, you have uh, examples with too high inflation and in, in red with too low inflation. So the story is that monetary policy is, of course, because it has only one uh, um, one mandate, one um, objective. It, it's, it goes in the right direction, tightening when uh, uh, tightening when inflation is too high and loosening when inflation is too low. Uh, for fiscal policy, is less the case, and you have a very strange example uh, for France in the eighty one, where you have both monetary loosening and fiscal loosening. A uh, recent exa example of the UK, a very short example of the UK with monetary tightening and fiscal loosening. Uh, you, uh, there is a kind of uh, consensus today to say that uh, monetary policy should be tightening while fiscal policy uh, should well avoid loosening and be neutral. And I think it's a, a very good uh, uh, consensus. It's difficult to carry out in practice. There is a challenge. In, in fact, there is a challenge to switch from uh, demand side fiscal policy to supply side fiscal policy. If you think about subsidization of gas storage, or uh, if you think uh, subsidization of consumption cuts, uh, for instance, by energy intensive uh, um, companies, uh, this could have a significant impact on inflation and uh, downward impact on inflation. So even if it creates some deficit, we, we may not take this into account when um, calculating the fiscal stance in the sense of uh, de aggregate demand uh, stimulate, uh, stimulation. And the most difficult part, uh, I think, is uh, redistribution, the last uh, point. Uh, where you want, uh, well, there is a times of trade shocks, so uh, someone <laughs> needs to lose, and uh, you want to protect uh, the uh, lower end of the income schedule. Uh, so, uh, in a sense, you 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 want inflation progressively to kick in uh, the purchasing power of some uh, better off uh, households, and this is very difficult. In France, uh, and, and this is my final point. Uh, concerning heterogeneity, the heterogeneity of policies. In France, there is a lot of in indexation at the lower end of the income schedule. So uh, the government needs to be very careful uh, about uh, the, uh, the loop because uh, of a large part. So it's less than in Belgium, but still there is some indexation. And the, the pain is uh, in the middle class uh, um, because these are they have incomes that are not indexed uh, automatically. And here, uh, there is a lot uh, that the political economy is uh, very, very, uh, um, uh, as, as, you, as you see these days, uh, the political economy goes in the direction of protecting uh, a large part of the population. So this is the, the main issue. And as I've shown with um, simulations, uh, some Partial indexation is really necessary uh, to uh, reduce uh, inflation. Thank you very much.
You are muted. You are muted. You are muted. Yes, now it works. You hear me? Okay, yes. great. Um, yeah, so, okay. First of all, let me say thank you um, for coming here to the Ministry of Finance, uh, to my office in Berlin. Um, I think it, it's so important to have a, a lively exchange between uh, science, economists, and policy making. Um, we are trying to do our best to actually follow all the 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 um, conclusions you have in in research, and it's so important to have that exchange. So thank you very much, first of all, to uh, for being here. Um, yeah, I wanna I wanna discuss the paper uh, quickly from a more a policy oriented uh, point of view. Um, uh, as Agnes, I also will not speak to on monetary policy. I will uh, discuss it more from the economic and fiscal policy fiscal policy side. Um, so first of all, um, and not only from monetary and fiscal um, from a fiscal and economic policy point of view, but also from a German uh, fiscal policy view. Uh, so first of all, I think we are trying to to um, get fiscal policy that doesn't uh, hinder the work of the ECB, that uh, supports the ECB in fighting inflation and uh, get, getting to target. Um, if, I, if I look at your, uh, your different dominances, um, then the first one is fiscal dominance, uh, the risk of fiscal dominance. I think there, to address that risk um, in Germany, we try to get back to the debt break, which we have in, in our constitution. Um, we are trying at the European level to support uh, um, common fiscal rules, which try to uh, address the, the risk of fiscal dominance. If we look at the financial dominance, uh, I think Germany was quite uh, early in in increasing uh, macroeconomic policy, uh, macro prudential policies to actually build up uh, substantial buffers in the in the financial um, in the financial system, and uh, at the European level, I think we also support uh, breaking the the sovereign bank nexus and uh, addressing the concentration concentration of uh, bonds in the bank balance sheets. And uh, the, to, to the third uh, dominance that you mentioned, the recession dominance, I think also there, fiscal policy tries to forcefully uh, and targeted um, to address the recession risk. We, we implemented different uh, fiscal packages in the, in the last months, um, which, which try to address that, that recession risk. Um, when I when I think of uh, what you were talking about about the dominance and the, especially the short term outlook, um, I would also want to add to the discussion a more uh, medium term medium term outlook, um, because if I look at the medium term outlook in Germany, I see different other risks, different other factors, um, which might make this low growth, high inflation environment actually more persistent than just a, a, sh a short term thing. Um, first of all, already before the, the COVID pandemic, we saw uh, low productivity uh, growth rates, um, which per se already um, have the risk of having higher inflation, pressure, higher inflationary pressures and lower, uh, weak, weaker growth. A second factor, which is uh, which will be very dominant in Germany in the coming years, we already see shortages and bottlenecks in different parts of the economy. Will be the demographic will be demographic change. Um, so in Germany, a lot of a large part of the population will actually get close to the retirement age or get into retirement age in the coming years. And as I said, we already see it in the economy in different places, but this will, will worsen over time and will also put pressure on price, uh, upward pressure on prices and downward pressure on growth. A third one, uh, climate policy. So of course we always um, um, try to find good uh, policy in the, to, to address climate change, 
which will increase growth and which will uh, then bring down prices. But there is a risk there that we will also see an inflationary effect of that of carbon pricing and of uh, the, the transformation in general to, towards more climate neutral uh, technologies. And the fourth factor, which is also uh, quite important for Germany, um, the, the, the new kind of globalization that we might get in the coming years. Uh, also there, um, prices might go up because we are not only trading with the, the cheapest trading partner anymore um, and productivity will go down because we are not using all the, the benefits of division of labor basically anymore. So we have a, a whole range of factors which might lead to, um, to stronger inflationary pressures, higher inflationary pressures and, uh, and, and lower growth also in the medium term. And against that background, the question is what would be the, the, right, the right fiscal policy? And uh, a few um, months ago, we, or weeks ago, we published a, a fiscal policy strategy, a fiscal strategy here in the, in the Ministry of Finance, which tries to address those three, uh, those, uh, those um, short and medium term risks. And which also resembles some of the things which I saw on, on your slides, but, but, but also what I saw on NNS. Uh, slides. So the, the strategy basically has three pillars. So we have the, the first pillar, which is crisis stabilization, where we say we need to maintain the productive capacity of, of the economy, but we need to do that in a limited and temporary way um, uh, and try to design the support measures in a way so that we get to a, a longer term transformation. Um, the second pillar, growth through supply side policies. Basically, everything that helps us increase productivity or increase the, the product, production capacities of the, of the economy. That's, of course, uh, a wide range of, of, uh, of economic policies which can help here, um, which promote self-sustained growth. Um, it starts with innovation and the right environment for startups, but also it, it, it goes to education, R&D, uh, skilled immigration, skilled labor in, in general, but of course also investment, investment especially on, in the private sector, but also on the, in the public sector. And the, the, third, the third pillar, uh, fiscal resilience. Basically, um, yeah, Going back to the to the debt break, uh, reducing the debt to GDP ratio over time, um, and ensuring the favorable financing conditions that uh, with uh, with the credible in institutions that we have in that we have in that we have in place. This um, is uh, the the fiscal policy strategy that we published for uh, as the German um, Ministry of Finance, and I think it already addresses. At least some of the the dominance issues which uh, which you raised and which we discussed uh, um, here already today. Thank you very much, Ricardo. I need to uh, yes ask you, you your response to the responses, and um, yes, and then we probably have time for a couple of questions before we finish up. Terrific. So let me more than respond. I think uh, let me thank the the four panelists because I think they. Uh, enrich in the discussion on different types of dominance. If anything, I mean, I I was so apologetic at first for being such a such a gloomy economist bringing all these dominances, and then Federica came and added two more, so she doubled down. The reaction economists, oh no, let me be even more gloomy. Yeah, if um, you were glass half empty, it's about two thirds <laughs> empty now. And so, uh, and likewise with the other discussion uh, with the other panelists. And let me make, um, I think we're very useful. Let me make a few observations. Some things that they said, which I think people may find useful. Um, because I don't really disagree with anything that has been said in any sense. And it's all, I think, broadly consistent with also the message, which is us as a group of economists trying to contribute to warning signals, things that could go wrong. First, on Federica, um, the reverse currency war is, I believe, an extreme manifestation of what is ultimately the global financial cycle. The fact that now for a very long time, uh, we see that changes in the interest rate policy of the Federal Reserve seem to be a very strong driver of the interest rate policy of the ECB, the Bank of England, many of the central banks around the world. Um, 
that is a dominance for sure in that Fed's policy is seems to be driving other interest rates. It happens through exchange rates, but not only. It happens also through financial stability. And there's a very rich research that um, that I know you know well uh, that leads to those uh, inter interactions coming. As a result, when now given that the Federal Reserve is now seems quite committed to bring inflation down, and assuming that let's take as given that it succeeds or at least moves in that right direction. Then in terms of at least my dominances, there would be a dominance of the Fed over the ECB in the right direction, meaning at least in bringing ECB inflation also down, meaning the risk there would be that the ECB is too little dominated by the Fed, meaning gets out of sync with the global financial cycle, and that leads to those uh, changes in exchanges that you noted, as well as potential changes in financial conditions. But at the same time, and I think this came up a little bit in Olivia's talk, the shocks are different right now. Um, for all purposes, and as a good approximation, the U.S. has no supply shock. Oil prices are already below what they were in 2000, at the end of 2021. The U.S. does not use Russian gas. Prices of energy, even broad index indices for the U.S., are now relatively stable and low. And so if we're talking about a recession now, simply because we think we had excess demand and we're bringing it down, whereas in the euro area, we have a clear, striking energy shock and the market shock. So... To elaborate on what you said, I think it is um, it is a case where there used to be a dominance that being dominated was okay, or certainly it worked in the last 20 years. And now escaping that dominance is both a source of danger as well as though a necessity. It seems um, repeating, I think, I think I believe it was Olivia, maybe Agnes that noted, while I think that interest rates in the ECB in the euro area have to go to at least 3%, um, I'm very much of the view, as I said, the Volcker view of the overshooting that they should go up quickly to three and a half and then be brought down quickly as well, given the fear of the recession and the market shock. Whereas in the US, it seems to me unimaginable that inflation will come down if rates don't go above at least five and a half or so. So I think that's just a very delicate balance. And I think the considerations Federico brought are very important. But in that mix of do you want to be more or less dominated by the Fed, um, there's actually an in-between there that, um, um, anyway, hopefully you guys found it interesting. Second observation on the fiscal dominance. Olivia uh, rightly put it and that the fiscal dominance these days is all about servicing of the debt, what I call the debt revenue. That's really the fiscal dominance. It's not about the finance ministers getting together and saying, pay my bills. It's about how worried are you with the impact that interest rates have on bond prices and therefore on the cost of servicing of the debt. But then Olivia said, well, but I think that's not really the key thing. I think it's much more going to be financial. But one point that I try to make in the paper and that I'll elaborate even more now is how the two are very intrinsically connected. Um, that ultimately, you know, and you see this in the UK in the last four weeks, you see this in the US in 2020, there's a problem in bond prices and with debt servicing costs. And immediately we say, well, but because these government bonds are being used as collateral liquidity here and there, this triggers a financial crisis. And so as a result, the financial crisis seem to be very tightly linked to the bond prices. And therefore, once I think about fiscal dominance as being all about bond, government bond prices, then that distinction becomes one that's very hard to make. And more, um, let's go back a few months to uh, the ECB finally starting to raise rates, in my view, a few months behind time. I don't think it was a coincidence that rates were finally raised at the same time, as the ECB announced a plan, the TPI, a program, that was all about controlling rates on government bonds, not because of fiscal dominance, but because of financial dominance and the fear of how uh, otherwise there would be a, a, an effect through spreads. In other words, walking backwards, I think somewhat controversially, but not out of line, that there was an element of fiscal dominance via financial dominance holding back the ECB from raising rates earlier if I go back in June, May, or April. And so to that extent, I'm a little less confident than Olivia that there is no fiscal dominance at all in the euro area. It's more subtle, and I can look back at the recent future and see a little bit of evidence for it, and as a result, be more worried than he is, I think, moving forward. Even if it is a particular very far fiscal dominance that intersects with financial dominance, and it's always about what's happening to the government bond prices or not. Third observation. Um, uh, Agnes, on the wage and the role of the governments. Um, I think, you know, again, looking forward and in the spirit of this panel, looking forward and looking at dangers and others, 
uh, let me be, I guess, less of a danger, but more of a, a peculiarity that we're seeing right now in terms of wage developments in the euro area and in the United Kingdom. Um, facing a very negative supply shock, um, traditionally, we would see a very large increase in unemployment as the adjustment happened through more people losing their jobs, even at the same time as we wouldn't see much of wage cuts because of very strong dom downward nominal wage rigidity. Because we have such high inflation, what we're seeing right now in the euro area, France included, is instead nominal wage increases of 3 to 4%, which in light with 8% inflation are a round of a real wage cut of 3 4%. And lo and behold, we're heading into 2023 with a very peculiar recession in the euro area, a recession in which we see no signs of unemployment rising, but instead a recession coming through a fall in disposable income, a fall in GDP because of wages being cut by 4%. If you want, it's an RBC or a classical recession as opposed to a Keynesian recession. Uh, insofar as it's not showing up in unemployment, it's showing up through real wages, through income and through GDP. It's still a real recession and uh, it's a real recession. Uh, insofar as it's hurting income and well-being in the same way, but it's happening that way. And it's happening, why? Because of the high inflation that we have. But I think it's a clear case of where um, the high inflation, again, has its benefits, or maybe not, but at least it's leading to a different kind of recession and requiring different policy responses. Compare it with what's happened in the UK in the last two months. Or so. This has partly been due to governments, through their influence on minimum wages, as well as um, the wage bargaining centralized process, having essentially been able to support this fall in real wages uh, in the form of the recession we're about to have. Look instead of what happened in the UK, where we don't have those mechanisms. What you've had is every weekend for the last two months, as a resident of the United Kingdom, like Federica, we've had menu costs, meaning a strike every weekend as a different group wants to have its, its wage go by 8% and let someone else have their wage increase by 2% to reach that average four or five. Um, we've seen the menu costs on a daily, on a weekly basis. Uh, those are the costs of inflation that happen when the governments don't help in that coordination or when we don't have that coordination of wages, just to be very clear. And then finally, on the government control of prices, um, a point which um, let me hear again, for the sake of the debate, uh, push back a little bit on something Agnes said, which is absolutely mechanically almost, as you put it, if the government controls some prices, at the end of the day, inflation is an average of prices, and that will bring down inflation somewhat. But the experience from emerging markets where these things are done all the time, and I don't pretend to be an expert, but I've seen enough of these at least, um, is that if the government pushes down inflation by, setting low, by having some of the price controls lower in one way or another, what the government is doing is because those prices fall more than the other ones, is that in real terms, the government is running deficits. Deficits that very quickly get large and that accumulate within a few years. And the government finds itself that after maybe a few months of being able to drive down inflation through price controls, it takes only two or three years for instead, it, the, the deficits and the debt associated with it growing so much and so much and so much that the government finds itself having to abandon the price controls and now facing a very large amount of debt, causing inflation because of the pressure of how high the debt is and the fiscal dominance that that entails. That is, in other words, I don't think that government control prices can help with inflation. All it can do is delay inflation and actually lead to more inflation later on, two years later, through a fiscal channel, perhaps. And so I worry a lot about leading that channel just because I've seen this happen in emerging markets very often. Does it mean it always has to happen? And it does mean that in a time of high volatility, this government control can help smooth the inflation. But there is, I think, this big danger of it leading to just more inflation later on when the debt that results from those government price controls uh, endangers its own inflation later. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. Well, we've got, a, we've got a few minutes left. So let's say we have time for, if there are two questions in the room, we could take two questions in the room. Yes, well, there is there one other? And yes, there as well. Yeah, so we take these two questions. They have to be reasonably quick fire. I know this isn't a quick fire subject, but you know. I'll be quick and wanted to thank Ricardo and all the panelists, also in the name of the managing editors of economic policy for this fantastic session. Here's the quick question. And of course, the uh, finance minister for hosting us. Thank you very much. Um, the quick question is how worried should we be about financial stability risks given this large increase in interest rates? And if I 
uh, if we follow Ricardo, even probably a stronger short-term overshooting, how do we deal with that? Yeah, that's great. And we'll take the other one as well. Before the last year, central banks were trying to convince financial markets that they would lead inflation be positive and high if average inflation targeting was adopted. So aren't central banks losing credibility by stepping back on their promise on long-term plans as soon as inflation started to be positive? Great questions. Quick fire answers. I spoke too much, but I'll just answer very quickly. On the first one on Moritz, I think Olivier hit it on the nail, which is it's an issue of, as I'm saying, you need to raise them and raise them relatively quickly, but not too quickly. I think a lot of the issue with financial markets is just dealing with changes in the bonds. I mean, I think the example in the UK is a very clear. The increasing interest rates helps the pension funds in many ways, uh, but it was so sudden on the budget on how quickly it happened in a couple of days that some positions were exposed and lead to a problem. So it's an issue really of pace. Uh, I don't think it necessarily has to interfere with you overshooting. It's still the case that it's basically a reason for why you don't want to increase interest rates by 300 basis points now, but want to do it in 50 basis point meetings every month. And then the macro prudential tools, I think, help along the way. And then on Nicola's very good question, I think that's completely right that we want a little bit of inflation, but I think we're just over it. If inflation was 4% right now, and I think, I, um, I think we, I'd be saying, great, you know, we're doing the average, we're below it. 4% for a year or two, and then let's bring down to two, and that would have been great. It's just that we lost control of that, and now we're at nine. And so as a result, I don't think that going back would be a deviation. I think essentially you're completely right six months ago. I think right now it's just gone too high that I don't think that danger is present. Great, thank you. And I just want to ask on our remote panel, do any of you particularly want to make a final comment or add anything? If not, you're welcome not to. No hands. That's no, uh, just just oh, quickly Olivia, yes, because Olivia, I, Olivia. I, I want to disagree with Ricardo on an important point, which is the role of protection programs in protecting people, but also in lowering inflation. I think to the extent that we think that the gas prices are going to be very high, but are going to come down to a much lower level in a year or two, then I think it actually makes sense to smooth it out. France has had only five percent inflation as a result of this. This implies smaller second round effects. And to the extent that these price caps at some stage become irrelevant because the price has decreased, I think this is a good way of fighting inflation. Let me stop there. Thank you very can much. I Thank ask, you. Oh, if I yes. can add something, uh, I, I think uh, in principle, I would not disagree uh, with uh, Ricardo, less inflation today with Ms. more tomorrow, but the, the, point, the whole point is about managing inequalities. So if, if inflation goes out of control very quickly, then you have a, a huge increase in inequalities that the government cannot control. So the idea is not permanent control of prices, of course, but it's uh, how to distribute the loss across households, across firms, and between households and firms. This is all about uh, how, the management of the, of the shock. And I think we sh and the fact that real wages are, are on the... Are, um, Falling today, it's not really a, a, a proof of, of anything because we all know that uh, the increase of wages, nominal wages, will be spread over at least two years. So um, I think we really have here a, a, dan a danger of an explosion of inequalities and uh, political economy danger. Uh, which needs to be managed and we should not. Um, and so in that perspective, uh, price controls could be one additional temporary tool. Um, but of course, it's not the solution in the long term. Inflation, not that, it, not that it doesn't have other effects and they may be a good policy. And on Olivia, completely right. That's The answer to my objection is exactly that. I was making a point, if it's persistent, if it's temporary, then absolutely, then you're right. So I agree with both things said. Yeah. It's just whether it should be an active policy to bring down inflation as opposed to monetary policy is where it gets limited. Sorry. I, I, you, you're very welcome, but we have to stop because we've run out of time. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Ricardo, for a, a, a great presentation. Thank you to everyone on the panel for uh, to, for raising all those points. There is, uh, there is so much to digest and it is so important. Thank you to everyone who's been uh, who's been watching online. And to everyone in the room as well, I believe the next order of business is dinner. Well, it certainly is for everyone in the room. Whatever you do online, then that's fine. You, you know, if you want dinner, I hope it's a good one. Um, so uh, join us 
tomorrow morning for the next sessions. Uh, but uh, meanwhile, from all of us on the panel, thank you for watching and good night. <laughs> Thank you very yeah, much for being right. here. Good. I thought it was an interesting discussion. Oh, very nice. Yes. You guys enjoy the conference here? No, That's right. already? Yes, of course. Yeah. 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 Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. So do we go to dinner now? Is dinner uh, a little later?